Hello and welcome to another video for STAT212. In this video we're going to be doing some basic probability, so nothing um, too difficult or crazy yet, um, but we will do something a little bit more complicated in the next videos. Um, but first, just kind of starting off with what is probability. Um, it's um, kind of the science for understanding the likelihood of different events, and it helps us kind of measure or rate the likelihood of something happening on a scale from 0 to 1 or 0 to 100 percent. Um, so 100 percent means that we are fully certain. 0 percent means that it is impossible. Um, so a lot of things we work with in the real world are going to be somewhere in between those two things. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't bother with statistics at all if we already knew if it was 0 or 100 percent. Um, so let's take a look at an example here um, to give some context to, to some, some terms that we're going to talk about. Um, let's say that we're doing um, a drug test to see um, um, our ability to correctly um, predict or rate the likelihood that somebody um, has, has taken drugs recently. Um, so this, this test is going to give us either a, a positive result to indicate evidence of drugs or a negative result saying no evidence of drugs. Um, and let's say in this case uh, that all the adults in this study we're being honest. Um, so I don't honestly know if this is fictional data or if this was actually collected. It comes from a textbook, which makes me think this was actually collected data. Maybe that maybe I'm wrong. Um, so we also have over here subjects who did actually use drugs in the time frame and subjects who did not. And we can kind of see um, how often this drug test gave us a correct result, how often it gave us a positive result, um, different things like that. So since this is biostatistics, um, we should use a few terms um, that we, we commonly see um, in the medical world. So, so true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative. So, so keep these straight because we're going to be using them um, throughout the course um, for a lot of different problems. So a true positive would be somebody who correctly tests positive. Um, so positive for whatever indicator we're looking for and true meaning that it is correct. Um, so in general, maybe I should also kind of add over here, true equals correct, meaning that the test gave the correct result. False means incorrect, meaning that the test gave the incorrect result. Positive then would mean that um, the thing that we were looking for was uh, presented as being found. Um, negative meaning that whatever we were looking for was not found, according to this drug. Um, but keep in mind that um, tests often have errors, right? They're not going to be perfect measures. I mean, maybe, maybe some of them are. Um, but a lot of tests, especially in the medical world, are not going to be correct 100% of the time. It's possible to get a false positive, meaning that the test indicates the presence of something that isn't actually there. And it's also definitely possible to get a false negative, meaning that the test did not find evidence of something there when there really is something there. But if it's a good test, hopefully these false positives and false negatives are fairly rare. Uh, but we can see that in this example, right? So, so people who um, were using drugs and tested positive are true positives. Uh, people who were using drugs but got a negative result would be false negatives, meaning that they, they tested negative even though they truly had the condition that this test is apparently looking for. Okay. Let's also look at a few other terms um, that are kind of um, foundational for probability. Um, a sample space is going to be the set of all possible outcomes in a trial that we're looking at. In other words, um, if, we're, if we're conducting a test or we're collecting data, the sample space would be all the different possible outcomes that we could find. So if the data we're collecting is categorical, kind of like it is in this example up here, um, we might say that there's four different possibilities. Um, now, it depends on kind of what our frame of reference is. So if our sample space is just drug test results, then we might just say that there's two results. There's either positive or negative are the two results in the sample space. However, if we're looking at the sample space for uh, drug results and the correctness of the results, then we might consider all four of these as being the sample space, meaning that there's kind of four combinations of results if that's our frame of reference. Okay. But that would be for categorical data. Uh, but when we're working with numeric data, um, you might think of um, the sample space then as being kind of a numeric range from 
a minimum to a maximum value. So um, for example, uh, if I asked you how many keys do you have on you, so if we're out, you know, outside walking around, and I said how many keys do you have on you, that would be a question that has a minimum sample space of zero and a maximum of, I guess, positive infinity, because I don't really know if there's a limit. Maybe there is some kind of human limit that we could find for how many keys you could possibly carry. Um, but right, there is, you know, it, all we know is a minimum of zero and a maximum of some unknown number of keys. So we might say that the, the sample space is zero to positive infinity. Um, and we also might go further and clarify if this is a discrete sample space or a continuous sample space. So, so in the case of keys, uh, I'm guessing that would be a discrete sample space. Um, I suppose maybe you could have a half a key, um, but, but I think we would typically understand that all as, as discrete values where you're going to have one, two, three, four. It's not going to be something that you measure to more precision. Um, so we could either have a discrete sample space or a continuous sample space, depending on what we're measuring. Some other terms here. So a trial would just be a process or action with a set of possible outcomes. So in the example above, having an individual take a drug test could be considered one trial. So it's one measurement, one data collection opportunity. Um, similarly, if I'm doing a survey, then me uh, talking to somebody and asking a question is kind of like a trial, right? So, so I'm collecting data as a one, it is a um, one unit data collection event. Um, oftentimes you might think of collecting data from like throwing dice or something like that where the dice throw is a trial, right? So anytime that I am, I have kind of one singular data collection event for one unit of data collection. So how many trials were completed in the previous example with the drug testing? Uh, so you might notice that we had uh, 555 people here. So that means that um, we had 555 trials um, going on there. Outcomes and events. So outcomes would refer to kind of these individual possibilities in my sample space, right? So getting a positive test result is one particular outcome. Um, or having five keys is a possible outcome, right? So it's, it's just a, a term for these things that could happen. Now an event is going to be a set of one or more possible outcomes that we might have an interest in um, talking about. So for example, I could ask about the event of getting a correct test result. So if I go back here, um, if my event is getting a correct test result, you might notice that that includes two different outcomes. There's the true positives and there's the true negatives. So those are two different outcomes that make up the event getting a correct test result. Um, I could do this with numeric data as well. Maybe I'm just interested in um, the event that somebody has more than five keys on them, right? So that would be um, that would be an event where all the outcomes of five and above, or did I say more than, more than five or at least five, I forget. Um, we'll, we'll say more than five. So, so then having six, seven, eight, nine, ten keys, et cetera, would all be outcomes inside that event having more than five keys. Um, something else um, just to mention here that we'll see is that we often kind of uh, denote an event with a capital letter. It doesn't have to be that, but, but that's kind of common notation. Um, so a lot of times we'll say something like let A be the event that Felicity gets an incorrect test result. Um, so that would be a very common way for us to kind of define an event. And then we can use A instead of writing out a description of the event every time. Complement. So that's another term to be aware of. Um, the complement of an event is the scenario where that event does not happen. So it's all the outcomes not inside that event space. So if you think about the sample space, um, there's all the possible outcomes, and if I define an event, that's going to include one or more particular outcomes that fit that, and the complement of that event is going to be everything else. So it's the, it's the event that this other event doesn't happen, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so just another term to be aware of there. All right, so here's a very simple example with dice where we just kind of show examples of, of several of these terms in action. So um, let's say that I'm rolling a six-sided dice. Each time I throw the dice, that's one trial. That gives me one piece of data. 
um, there are six different outcomes when I do that. Um, and those six different outcomes comprise the sample space. So the sample space would be this whole set of events. So you could also say the sample space is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. We also know um, that these six outcomes should add up to 100%. So each of these outcomes has a probability of happening. It's possible that we might look at a situation where an outcome has a 0% probability of happening under certain conditions. Um, but the idea is every outcome has some probability between 0 and 100%. And the sum of all possible outcomes should add up to 100%. Um, so um, let's say that we define an event A. And maybe our um, event A, let's see. OK, yeah, so here's an example. So if event A is getting a 1, then A complement is going to be getting not, the event of getting not a 1. Uh, the sample space for A complement is going to be 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And we also know that this, the sum of the probabilities of A and A complement should add up to 100%. So I mentioned this complement thing a lot because we are going to look at some problems later where remembering the complement is going to help a lot. Remembering that the, the sum of all probabil of the probabilities of all possible outcomes equals 100% can come in handy to calculating probabilities for other things. So, so good to know. All right, so let's look at some simple events here as well. So um, simple events are events that involve just one trial. We just have one um, kind of one trial with a set of all possible with a set of possible outcomes and um, we're calculating the probability of a particular event happening um, and if they're equally likely that makes it even easier so for example throwing a six-sided dice would be um, a simple event with equally likely um, outcomes so in that case um, if we're looking for the probability of a particular event it's just going to be the number of outcomes where that event occurs divided by the total number of outcomes possible. So let's look at some examples here. What is the probability of rolling an odd number on a six-sided dice? So this is a simple event with equally likely probabilities. So then my numerator is just going to be um, the number of outcomes that meet this event divided by the total number of outcomes possible. So then let's say let a be getting an odd number. I'm just going to make this like super formal. Um, we don't always have to be this formal when we calculate these things because we're all sitting here like, well, we all know what the answer is, but, but we'll do it formally anyway. Then A is going to have a sample space of 1, 3, 5. So then the probability of A is going to be these three outcomes that give us that event divided by the total number of possible outcomes, which would be six, right? So if I throw a dice, there's six possible outcomes. Three of these meet this event, so the probability of A must be three out of six, assuming all the outcomes are equally likely. Okay. Uh, we can use the same principles to calculate estimated probabilities with collected data, too. So, um, if we go back to the drug testing example, what is the probability that a randomly selected person receives a positive test result? So if we think of our, of our data as um, either positive or negative test results, um, we can calculate the number of, or identify the number of people with a positive test result divided by the total number of tests that we have data for. So it looks like if we're looking for positive test results, that's gonna be 45 here and 25. So then number of positives is going to be 45 plus 25, which equals 70. So then um, probability for positive, I didn't really give it a letter here, which I guess is fine. So the probability of positive is going to be 70 divided by 555. And so notice this word, I'll, I'll just kind of highlight this because we will return to this um, either, I think it might just be a later chapter actually, um, where I, I said calculate the estimated probability um, involving this collected data. So what we mean by that is um, if we're trying to judge 
um, the probability of being positive in this particular population, uh, we realize that if we only have a sample of people, this is really just an estimate. This is really just a sample statistic of that proportion. So this is a sample proportion, um, and we're trying to use it to estimate a population proportion, the proportion of people in the population who test positive according to this test. Um, so, so just kind of important to highlight there. Um, with the dice, we we don't we can just calculate what's called the theoretical probability. But we're with the um, collected data drug testing example, we're, we're using something called an empirical probability. But we'll talk more about that, um, I believe, in the next chapter. Um, another kind of simple probability situation would be calculating rates. Um, so rates is a simple probability, but usually converted to a more readable format. Um, so we're talking about like the incidence rate, the prevalence rate, a mortality rate, something like that. Um, so, so by the way, incidence would be um, the um, probability of um, people, oh, I, I always get incidence and prevalence mixed up. So prevalence is how many people have it now, incidence is something else. I'll have to think about that one. Mortality is the probability or the proportion of people who would pass away or die from a particular condition. Uh, so these are used, um, these are calculated using empirical data and would follow this kind of pattern where we find the total number of people who meet this condition divided by the total number of people um, susceptible or in the population of interest. So for example, out of 3,953,000 live births, there were um, 23,900 deaths of infants under year, um, one year of age. So then the mortality rate, the infant mortality rate then, would be this number divided by the total, which gives us a pretty small probability. So this works, this is correct. Um, however, this is not a super easy number to read and interpret, especially for a lay audience. So a lot of times we might um, take this rate and convert it to a more friendly format. So instead of reporting this as 0.6%, we might report this as six out of a thousand. So meaning that there's six infant deaths out of 1,000 births per year. So the way that we would do that is by just kind of moving this decimal over the required number of times. So we're going to go one, two, three times. So this is six out of one, or point, sorry, 0 0.006 out of one, which we're going to change to one, two, um, six out of 1,000. So just by moving that decimal over the same number of places, we can convert this to um, um, kind of this, this friendly rate format. So let's practice with this example right here. Um, so let's calculate the HIV prevalence rate and convert it to an appropriate whole number rate. So US population is 312 million and some change at the time this data was collected. Number of HIV infected persons was 1,155,792. So if I want to first just find the proportion, find the, uh, the prevalence rate, I would just um, do this over the total. And let me grab my calculator, which I think is in this pouch somewhere. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to do this calculation. And I get um, 0 0.0369, if I did that correctly. Uh, let me just make sure. I'm going to double check all my numbers. 55. Oh, you know what? That is incorrect because I doubled the 5 there. So let me do this one more time. And I get 0 0.00369. So I just had one extra, or I was missing one zero there. So this comes out to 0 0.00369. So now if I want to convert this to a friendlier whole number, um, there's a couple options here. That, so it doesn't have to be one particular way, but, but often we, we would convert it such that the first number is a single digit whole number. So one option here is to go one, two, three, and to make this 3.69 out of 1,000. 
which would round to 4. So 3.69, or that's going to round up to 4 out of 1,000. Or if you want to, because since this is kind of close to the middle, one other option here is to do um, 37 out of 10,000. That would, that would um, be easy to, to read as well. So um, just move that decimal one more place over and then round 36.9 to 37. I'd say both of those are, are fine. Okay, so um, just kind of a heads up here. These different calculations we did so far are assuming equally likely probabilities among our sample space. Um, but it's possible that we might have a situation where the probabilities of all outcomes are not equally likely. So we just have to kind of keep our eyes open for that. So here's an example where we have to be a little bit more careful, where we have a can of mixed nuts. Um, I like mixed nuts a lot, so that's why I picked this, this context. And it, it just made sense to me because I always think about how the nuts are not equally distributed in, in the can. Um, I, I, really, um, I really like uh, pecans, um, but there's always not very many pecans, unfortunately. Um, so let's say this can of nuts has peanuts, pecans, cashews, and almonds. Um, but for every one pecan, there's going to be two almonds, three cashews, and five peanuts. What is the probability that I would pull an almond at random under the assumption that um, the size of the nut has no effect on what I pull? So assuming that I'm just, we're, we're just kind of ignoring the size element and just I'm picking a singular nut from the can. Um, what's the probability that I, that I pull an almond? So we would be incorrect to say, okay, well, there's four different nuts, and what's the probability that I pick one of them out of, at random? It would be one out of four. No, 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 no. So it's not going to be um, four nuts, one over four. This would be bad, 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 right? So since they're not equally distributed, we have to weight um, each possibility appropriately. So it's really going to be um, um, one plus two, plus three, plus five, the denominator, and the numerator is going to be um, two. So there's two almonds for every, um, uh, or for out of 11 randomly selected nuts, we'd expect about two of them to be almonds. So we just want to um, distribute those appropriately there. Um, so this is going to come out to be two out of 11 would be the appropriate probability for this context. Um, so I just bring this up, not because uh, I'm going to like trick you on a problem as much as I just want us to kind of be aware that um, we are deciding up front, are these equally likely outcomes or non-equally likely outcomes? And if so, if it's not equally likely, is there a conversion that we need to do or something we need to be careful of as we make this calculation?